Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers an aldol condensation of propanol experiment. This is part one, the pre-lab. Today we're going to be synthesizing 2-methyl-2-pentenal via an aldol and dehydration reaction sequence. These are the overall balanced reactions for the sequence. In the first step, two molecules of an aldehyde, propanol, add in an aldol reaction. So here's one molecule of propanol, here's the other. And I'm just showing it in red here so that you can see where the atoms end up in the product. There's a position next to the carbonyl and propanol that's called the alpha position. That'll be important and we'll talk about that quite a bit later. The two propanol molecules add together in the presence of base to form the aldol product. This makes a new CC bond as indicated by the arrow. This product contains an aldehyde and an alcohol and hence the name aldol. This aldol product can undergo a dehydration reaction to give something called an alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde. In the presence of catalytic sodium hydroxide, it forms a species with a new double bond between the alpha and beta positions and water is produced as a co-product. Learning objectives for this experiment are described on this slide. At the end of this experiment, you'll be able to predict products of an aldol condensation dehydration reaction sequence and assess their atom economy, carry out an aldol condensation dehydration reaction sequence and then isolate and characterize the product, use distillation as a tool for driving an unfavorable reaction as well as purifying liquids, use IR and NMR spectroscopy to prove the identity of the product isolated from the reaction mixture, and determine the yield of a product that doesn't have simple one-to-one -one stoichiometry. Here's some aldol theory basics. Protons on the carbon next to the carbonyl group in an aldehyde or ketone, called the alpha position, are weakly acidic. The aldehyde in today's experiment has this structure, it's propanol. The alpha position here has two acidic protons. These can be plucked off by a base. Deprotonation of that alpha position gives a strong nucleophile that's called an enolate. Here's a structure of the enolate for propanol. It has two resonance structures. The structure on the left has the negative charge on the oxygen, and the structure on the right has it on the carbon. The structure on the left is the more stable resonance structure because it puts the negative charge on the more electronegative element. The enolate has partial negative charge on both the oxygen and the alpha carbon, but it tends to attack carbonyl groups through its alpha carbon, and that's how the aldol reaction works. So the enolate attacks another carbonyl carbon, giving a new CC bond. We're going to go through all of these steps in quite a bit more detail on the next slides. The first step in approaching an aldol reaction is to identify alpha carbons and protons. We're going to go through that on this slide. Aldehydes and ketones with protons on the carbon next to the carbonyl, the alpha position, can be deprotonated by a base to form an enolate anion. As an example, we'll start out with propanol in this week's experiment. Here's the alpha position of propanol, and I'll mark the alpha carbon with a red circle. And now you want to look at that carbon and see are there any protons attached to it and I'll mark those in a blue circle. These are alpha protons. Propanol has two alpha protons, and either one of these is subject to deprotonation with a base to form an enolate. Here's another aldehyde that's very similar in structure. It has an alpha carbon, and then it also has an alpha proton, so this can also form an enolate. That proton could get deprotonated by a base. Here's another example of an aldehyde that has an alpha carbon, but this aldehyde doesn't have any alpha protons, so this one can't form an enolate. So this one can't undergo an aldol self-condensation the same way that those other two aldehydes can. You can analyze ketones in the same way. Here's a ketone, and it has an alpha position on the left, and it also has an alpha position on the right. These two alpha carbons both have hydrogens on them. The carbon on the left has three hydrogens in alpha positions, and the carbon on the right has two alpha position hydrogens. This molecule can form two different enolates, an enolate that results from deprotonation of the left alpha position, and an enolate that forms from deprotonation of the alpha carbon on the right side. So it's a little bit more complicated than the above examples. Here's a ketone that has an alpha position on the left and right, but the position on the left doesn't have any protons attached, so it can't form an enolate on the left side. However, on the right side, there are two alpha protons, and it can form an enolate by getting deprotonated there. Here's another ketone that has an alpha carbon on the left and an alpha carbon on the right. And similar to the example just immediately above it, it has no alpha protons, though, so this one can't form an enolate either. On this slide, we'll talk about enolate formation. Deprotonation of the alpha proton by a base gives an enolate anion. The protons on the aldehyde propanol have a pKa of about 17. In the presence of sodium hydroxide, the hydroxide base can deprotonate one of these protons, and that gives the enolate anion shown here, and water. Water has a pKa value of 14, so it's quite a bit stronger acid than the propanol. This means that the equilibrium doesn't favor the enolate formation with hydroxide base. When propanol and hydroxide are put together, you get a little bit of enolate, but not a lot. It doesn't go to completion. Enolates are resonance stabilized anions, so we can draw a resonance structure for this enolate by taking the electrons on the oxygen and pushing them down onto the alpha carbon to generate this alternate resonance structure of the enolate. Enolates are strong nucleophiles, and based on the two resonance structures that we're seeing here, there's nucleophilic character at both the enolate's alpha carbon and the oxygen. 
In the aldol reaction, the enolate reacts as a nucleophile with C double bond O carbons through its alpha carbon. And the reason for that is kind of complicated and beyond the scope of this class. For this class, it's enough to just understand that it's this resonance structure and the alpha carbon here that attacks the carbonyl of another propanyl molecule. So we'll go through the aldol reaction mechanism on this slide. The enolate reacts as a nucleophile with C double bond O groups through its alpha carbon. Here's the enolate from the previous slide. And the enolate can attack the carbonyl carbon of another propanyl molecule and give a new carbon-carbon bond. That gives this species right here, where the new carbon-carbon bond is between the alpha position of the propanyl shown in black and the carbonyl of the propanyl molecule shown in red. Up to two new stereogenic centers can form in the aldol reaction, and that gives up to four possible stereoisomers. So stereochemically, the aldol reaction can be pretty complicated. In this example, we've generated two new stereogenic centers here. These can be either R or S, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. The next step is that the negatively charged oxygen deprotonates a water molecule to give a neutral aldol product, which is shown here. And in the process, that also regenerates the hydroxide catalyst. Now we're going to talk about aldol stereochemistry. As I mentioned on the previous slide, up to two new stereogenic centers can form in an aldol reaction. That gives up to four possible stereoisomers. Our aldol product in this week's experiment has two new stereogenic centers, and each one of these could be either R or S. So we'll go through the various possibilities. One possibility is the left stereogenic center is R, and the right one is S. Another possibility is the mirror image of this, where the left stereogenic center is S and the right stereogenic center is R. Then there's the RR stereoisomer and the SS stereoisomer, and those are our four possible stereoisomer products, and all four of these could actually form in the reaction mixture. Here are the relationships between these. The upper two are enantiomers of each other because they have the inverse stereochemistry at every stereogenic center. They're mirror images of each other that are non-superimposable. The same thing is true of the bottom two examples. These are non-superimposable mirror image molecules as well. These two are diastereomers. Diastereomers are stereoisomers that aren't mirror images. When you compare the stereochemistry at the stereogenic centers, it matches in some places and not others. You can see in the left stereogenic center it matches at R, but at the right stereogenic center it's opposite, S in the upper species and R in the lower. Their stereochemistry matches at some stereogenic centers, but not all. The same thing is true for the two molecules on the right. Those are diastereomers of each other as well. And then finally, the crossed relationships are also diastereomers here and here. Now I'll go through the aldol reaction mechanism and summarize it. In the first step, the aldehyde is deprotonated at the alpha position to give a resonance stabilized enolate anion, which is a strong nucleophile. That enolate has a resonance structure that's shown here. And it's the alpha position of the enolate that attacks another molecule of aldehyde, which I'm showing in red, to give a new C-C bond, and water. Then water supplies a proton to give the neutral aldol product, and the catalyst sodium hydroxide is also reformed. Aldol products can sometimes undergo dehydration reactions, and that's the case in today's experiment. The aldol product that we have is subject to dehydration. The key factor is whether the aldol product has an alpha proton. Aldol products that have an alpha proton may undergo a dehydration reaction. So if we take a look at our aldol product here and identify the alpha position again, we can see that there is actually an alpha proton here as well. That's an acidic proton, and it's subject to deprotonation by a base. So what can happen is the aldol product is deprotonated at the alpha position, giving another resonance-stabilized enolate anion. Sodium hydroxide can deprotonate it here, and that gives the enolate anion shown here, and water. Now, this enolate anion has a hydroxy group on it, which can function as a leaving group. Hydroxide is eliminated to give an alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde and reforming the catalyst. The way that works is the electrons on the negatively charged oxygen swing down, pushing the pair of electrons out of the carbon-carbon double bond over between the alpha and beta positions and eliminating the OH as OH-. That gives this alpha-beta unsaturated dehydrated aldol product water and regenerates the catalyst sodium hydroxide. This slide talks about the dehydration equilibrium. You might worry about hydroxide functioning as a leaving group. Usually you're told hydroxide is a poor leaving group because it's a strong base, and that is true. However, in this reaction, hydroxide is a starting material and a product. So although we generate a strong base in the reaction, we're starting with that same strong base. So really, these cancel out and don't figure into the reaction equilibrium. The dehydration reaction also doesn't strongly favor products. And what that means is that we get a mixture of aldol product and dehydrated aldol product. And if we want to get the dehydrated aldol product in a good yield, we're going to need to use Le Chatelier's principle to force the reaction to products. We can do that by removing the products as they form using distillation. This works because the products are more volatile than the aldol starting materials. 
the dehydrated aldol product in the right lacks the hydroxy group of the aldol product and therefore it boils a lot lower. This gets to the procedural steps in this reaction and it involves distillation and we're actually going to do three distillations in the experiment today. The first distillation just purifies the propanol starting material. The second distillation drives the dehydration reaction by distilling off the products as they form. The aldol product forms quite quickly when propanol is put in with hydroxide but the dehydration reaction needs a little bit more help and as we distill the products off we could push that reaction to completion and it works because the dehydration products are more volatile and the aldol products are less volatile. The third distillation that we'll do is just going to purify the dehydrated aldol product. The reactions in today's experiment are very green. They're safe and efficient. Here's the overall reaction sequence. Propanol is a volatile flammable material and it's also an irritant but it's not especially toxic. Two molar sodium hydroxide is mildly corrosive but it's really not that bad. If you look at the aldol reaction, it actually has perfect atom economy. No atoms are wasted in this reaction. The two propanols on the left side go to perfectly form the aldol reaction product and all those atoms are conserved. The dehydration reaction has pretty good atom economy because the only thing wasted is water. If you're going to throw something away, water is probably the best waste product to have. That ends this pre-lab lecture for the aldol condensation experiment. Stay tuned for the next video in the series that will cover carrying out the experiment. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.